So some of the things you've told us so far are that, you know, one, there, there does seem to be this standalone-ish language faculty that you can find in the brain that is dedicated largely to language, not yep. other forms of cognition. There is a language network in the brain. There are parts of the, of the brain, different parts that are interconnected that seem to be largely dedicated to linguistic processing. Yep. And I want you to unpack that in the context of something else you said earlier, which is... Um, you know, if you go back to the ideas of Chomsky around universal grammar, um, mm -hmm. the stuff that you often learn, I remember learning this in, in psychology and neuroscience classes. Mm -hmm. This is one of the, the dominant ideas or big ideas that's been there historically that humans have this innate language faculty and there's this sort of template in our brains that, that we all have. Yeah. How do you th think about, so on the one hand, you're saying there is a standalone language faculty. There are parts of the brain dedicated to this, but also that universal grammar, that general idea doesn't have a lot of support. Can you That's unpack right. that a little bit for me? Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. No, those are great questions. So, um, so th this question ties into um, a question of how does a language system come to be? Mm -hmm. And the way that I've talked about it as kind of a set of four meaning mappings that we can use to encode thoughts into word sequences and decode meanings from other se word sequences, um, already should tell you that it can be it can be innate, right? Because we have to learn those mappings. When I am born into the world, I don't know anything about what words may mean. I don't know anything about the mm -hmm. world, right? Well, that's debated, but you know, let's say for simplicity, let's say we know nothing. And if I'm placed in a Japanese family, I will learn Japanese. And if I'm mm -hmm. placed in a you know family in the Philippines, I'll learn Tagalog or whatever. And so, um, uh, it's a very deep and interesting question of uh, how these regions come to be language specialized regions. And the way to, of course, ask these questions is through developmental work. So mm. you can um, ask, you know, if I scan a five-year-old, do they have a language network? Turns out they do. If you scan a four-year-old, they do too. And a three-year-old, yeah, it seems to be already there, which of course makes sense because a three-year-old can pretty, in the pretty sophisticated ways, communicate already mm -hmm. using mm -hmm. language. Um, now, the most action in language learning happens between about six months of age when kids start learning to map words to meanings. The first evidence is around age six months and about one and a half years of age. Mm -hmm. Like that's where kind of the most intensive change happens. Now, that's a window during which studying brains of children is really, really challenging. Yeah, yeah. We can actually scan infants like, you know, in the first couple months of life. They're just mostly sleeping and you can study auditory processing even during sleep, which is what a lot of people do. And then you can scan them uh, using tools like functional MRI from about, you know, two and a half, three years of age. Two and a half is very challenging. I have a postdoc currently doing this. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a lot of it's a lot of very, very hard work. But like at around, you know, nine months or one, what these regions are doing is a very, very important question, because I think this can tell us something like, what is language made out of? Like, what what are the prereq? What are the circuits that become language circuits? Mm -hmm. To the extent that we find these regions, say, in a three year old, what are they doing when that kid is one? Are they responding to general kind of social stimuli? Are they responding to kind of abstract representations of meanings in the world? Are they responding to some kind of more abstract reasoning challenges? Right, and you know, and um, uh, we're you know <laughs> trying to see if we can make some headway on those questions by using. Uh, some combination of longitudinal scanning of like scanning infants um, and then scanning them later when they have the language regions, as well as scanning during this toddlerhood period to see if language regions respond to other things earlier on and later become more specialized. Um, but we we don't have an answer yet. There is some work from uh, Zainab Sagan's group uh, at um, Ohio showing that at least like by age three or four, the language system seems pretty specialized. Um, so, you know, there is that bit of evidence, but again, what's happening earlier, um, nobody knows yet. Um, uh, but yeah, you know, and, and, and a lot of like, a question that often follows this line of questioning is like, well, why does it always end up in the same place? Yes, and yes. the answer to that is, right, like if it's, if it's an acquired system, if it develops through experience, why is it always there? And the the question the answer likely lies in connectivity patterns like mm -hmm. it has to be connected yeah. to things where the information comes in and where it has to go out yeah. in the you know um, yeah. speech production realm. And I mean, I would imagine too. I mean, just experientially, everyone's everyone's experience is unique, but actually, they're mostly for most people quite similar, right? We're all using an auditory mapping, except for the small number of people that are that are auditorily impaired. And I would imagine the network does shift somewhat in those individuals. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, so, so sign language um, 
the high level processing is actually appears to be preserved, mm. which is kind of cool. It seems that that system of four meaning mappings is very abstract. Like yeah. it doesn't matter what modality yeah. you use. Of course, the perceptual mechanisms are going to be in a different place, right? It's going to be in the visual cortex because yeah, that's yeah. the part of the brain used to get the initial information out of the signal. I see. So, so there could be something here to do with connectivity that is um, independent of sensory modality, which would speak to why some of these regions you would point to on a brain map here are not in like a primary sensory area. They're in these yeah, in-between exactly. areas that can connect to any sensory modality. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yep. What, um, you know, I can anticipate your your answer to this, I think, based on what mm -hmm. you've told me so far. But, you know, if we go back to this question of to what extent are language and thought dissociable or certain co other cognitive functions dependent on language or, you know, synergizing with language to some extent, there's this famous idea in neurolinguistics and, and psychology called the saper whorf hypothesis, mm -hmm. which basically says that the language you learn constrains your cognition in very important ways. Um, what do you think about that hypothesis and how it fits with what you've told us so far? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting idea. And, uh, uh, I liked that idea because as a bilingual speaker, I kind of know the intuitions that people build on, but unfortunately there is just no evidence that supports these kinds of effects. So, um, people have made empirical claims based on certain phenomena that, for example, if you have multiple words for a particular part of the color spectrum, you're better at differentiating those colors. Or if mm. you have a word, a way to encode certain aspects of motion in particular kinds of events, you may be better at remembering those aspects of events. And most of these um, studies just don't seem to be robust to kind of scrutiny and replication. In fact, for almost any empirical claim that has been made in that space, there is now a few other papers that will say, okay, it's a failure to replicate. It doesn't seem like there's robust evidential support for this. That said, there is something to, there is something very true to the idea that culture, the cultural needs shape the language, um, that the, the word, the kind of the kinds of things that we talk about, right? So this idea of, you know, a hundred words for snow, there is something to that. Of course, if our environment is such that it's important for us to distinguish between these kinds of things, of course, we'll come up with more words to cover that part of the conceptual space. But it's not, it doesn't have to be cross-linguistic and cross-cultural. It could be um, uh, also witnessed within um, uh, within uh, uh, a society, right? Like if you are uh, a podcaster and you need to know a lot about like the, um, you know, auditory recording machinery, right? You'll have all these terms in your vocabulary that most people may not know, but it's important to you and your work. And so you'll expand that part of your yeah. conceptual space. And of course, you'll learn words for how to refer to those things. So some of that, in some sense, has to be true. But this idea that, you know, a particular language that you speak fundamentally reshapes your perception and cognition, um, I just don't mm -hmm. think there's evidential support for it. I see. So, so it sounds like the common denominator here is that uh, people's vocabularies and the types of words they use in their language will reflect the social and cultural needs of the culture they're born into, but that does not translate into opening up the possibility for some more domain general ability that yeah. isn't opened up by learning a different language. Exactly. Exactly. That's absolutely right. I see. Um, the other piece that's interesting here that I, that I want to um, touch on a little bit more. So we talked about this language network. We talked about some of the anatomy here. And then we also briefly mentioned the lateralization component of this, mm -hmm. that typically this language network is largely lateralized to one half of the brain rather that's than the other. Usually it's the left hemisphere, but mm -hmm. it can be the right also in some people. Mm -hmm. um, why does do we? Why would this lateralization happen? Why isn't it both sides? Do we have an explanation for for why things would be localized to one hemisphere? Um, so, <laughs> I don't think we have an answer to that, which is surprising because it's such a fundamental fact about language. So there's certainly reasons, computational and metabolic reasons, for why you might want to have a system within a hemisphere as opposed to straddling both hemispheres. That is, um, uh, you have you can have faster information transfer between, say, frontal and temporal lobes within a hemisphere mm -hmm. using the within hemispheric tracts compared to having to go through the interhemispheric connections to the other hemisphere. Mm -hmm. So, to, for so that's a general kind of argument for why you might have lateralization of function. Why it's in the left as opposed to the right. I don't think we have a clear mm -hmm. answer to. There's a lot of people working on this. There's stories, right? I mean, you say, oh, well, most people are right-hand dominant and maybe somehow from the 
uh, you know, early use of the right hand for kind of manipulation, tool manipulation, things like that, that somehow shifts the language. But that's it's very speculative. Moreover, if you actually look at, remember how we talked about the high level language system being separable from like the low level perceptual speech regions and speech production also like articulation regions. If you look at the lateralization of those earlier functions, they seem to be less lateralized than the higher level language system. So that mm. makes it very hard. Like they're much more bilaterally present. Like your speech cortexes, yeah. it does show a small bias, but it's much more bilateral compared to the language system, which is very, very heavily biased to the left. So that makes it really hard to say like, oh, some early sound perception bias or motor production bias shifted that system because if they're not even as strongly lateralized, it just kind of doesn't, the pieces don't fall together into a coherent story yet. But it's a very interesting thing to, very important thing to solve because um, one thing that you see in many brain disorders, including even ones that don't specifically have to do with language, is that the language system manifests more bilaterally. So for example, in individuals with autism and individuals with schizophrenia and individuals hmm. with just epilepsy, like any kind of brain disorder you take, you see this more bilateral manifestation. So something hmm. is obviously um, going differently in cases where the brain is not quite working in a typical way that leads to this manifestation. Um, and so it's really, really important to try to understand why does it go to the left in most common typical individuals and what's the functional importance of that and why does it lead to problems if it doesn't happen this way. Um, we're working on this. A lot of other groups are working on this. So maybe there'll be answers in the <laughs> next bunch of years.